Well, welcome, everyone. If you're just filing in, feel free to, to grab a seat. This session is best practices and what's new for managing Office 365 groups. This is awesome. We have a full house here. My name is Mike McLean. I am a program manager on the Office 365 Groups engineering team working at Microsoft. I work out in Redmond, Washington. This is my first time in Amsterdam. It's been awesome so far. Everybody's been fantastic. Uh, just a, a couple of things about the logistics today. Um, I was reminded last night I'm now the one with an accent, so I'll try to keep that in mind <laughs> a little bit. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to end uh, right on the hour. I know that there's a few sessions this week that have been running a, a bit long. Afterwards, I'll be available in the Ask the Experts uh, section uh, over there in the hub where the other Microsoft booths are. So if you have questions, feel free to, to let me know. Also, this session is being recorded, uh, so if you'd want to be eternally famous, feel free to ask a great question at the end of the session, and we'll try to get you recorded. <laughs> uh, so like, like, like I said, my name is Mike. Uh, I work on the, on the groups team. And uh, so today we're going to talk about Office 365 groups. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, some of the high-level concepts around Office 365 groups, and we're going to throw in a, a bunch of demos. Talking to folks at the booth yesterday and this week at the conference, seems like there's uh, a varying degree of understanding and adoption of groups. Some customers are, are just making that transition to the cloud. Uh, some customers are already using groups, and it sounds like they're really interested in how they can handle the life cycle and the proliferation of, of groups across their organization. Uh, so, so I've broken this talk in, into four main parts. The first part uh, is going to be around groups. What is the thinking from a Microsoft perspective? We'll talk about some of the new features that we've enabled in the platform over the past year. Uh, we'll do a short set of demos. And then we'll talk a little bit deeper around governance. Uh, so what does it mean when you've enabled self-service group creation in your organization? And, and how can you manage that? Uh, so we'll talk about things like uh, group expiry. How can you expire groups that maybe aren't being used? How can you implement naming policies and things like that? Uh, the third section is going to be around external collaboration. Uh, we know that teamwork isn't, um, isn't bound just to the people within the four walls of your company. So we'll talk about how Office 365 Groups facilitates that collaboration outside your organization as well. And then the last thing we'll touch on uh, is how you can really manage groups at scale. Uh, what does that mean? Well, a lot of people ask us, well, how does Microsoft manage groups? We have 100,000 employees, and we've enabled self-service. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and throughout the presentation, I'll provide a few anecdotes here and there around how I've seen certain customers manage groups and what's worked well for them in, in various industries. All right, so a quick show of hands. How many people are already using Office 365 groups in their organization? Might be through creating Microsoft Teams, planner plans. OK, great. Really good percentage here. Just for the recording, probably more than 50%. How many people are using it in a self-service manner where anyone can create groups, where it's not limited to just the IT admins? OK, <laughs> so that's maybe 20 to 30% or so, maybe about a third of folks. Great. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's really representative to what we see across, across the industry. Uh, and what we realized a few years ago is that the landscape of teamwork was changing drastically. Uh, people are collaborating on more projects. Uh, they're becoming more efficient. When you think about how business processes worked years ago, if I was soliciting feedback on a document and people were adding comments, I might have it on a file share, uh, co-authoring wasn't really that great, people maybe were sending me attachments. Now, uh, when we prepare for a conference like this, we've got half a dozen people in that deck all at the same time, modifying slides. Things are moving at a much more rapid pace. We're also collaborating with people outside of our company as well as inside. Uh, preparing for this conference, we have MVPs that are delivering sessions in other cities around the world. We've actually created an Office 365 group where we've added them as an external member, and they can get access to the conversations and the files, right? Uh, the third thing is the workforce is becoming much more diverse. In a couple of years, 50% of the workforce will be made up of millennials. And they have much different uh, demands and thoughts around the types of apps and, and collaboration that, that they want to perform. They're really used to an environment where they can download whatever app they need, get going quickly with folks, and then, and then they're off to the, to the races. Uh, so when, when we look at, at these uh, challenges, you might be asking, well, what, what's Microsoft doing to address it? And 
Uh, here's where we delivered Office 365 groups and applications like Microsoft Teams, Outlook, and Planner that really deliver a great universal toolkit. This provides a nice seamless experience for end users as they transition across the suite. In the old days, you would create, uh, let's say, a distribution list, right, where you'd want to email a group of people. Uh, and that was a request to the IT admin. And then the next day, you might realize, oh, we actually need to author some files. And so you'd go make a second request to provision a SharePoint site, where you're adding almost exactly the same number of people. Uh, well, Office 365 Groups really allows you to create one instance of that group, and it has a set of connected resources, and then those members have access to each of those services. Uh, this means that we've really simplified the needs on the IT department, which will allow them to focus on more important uh, initiatives where they're not having to just run around and chase down the creation of different resources. Uh, and the third thing that, that we've done is really tried to provide uh, some great insights and analytics in terms of the groups and their behavior and how they're, they're being used. So this really puts you in the driver's seat, either as the admin or the group owner, to really know what's, what's happening. All right, so how does this fit into, into teamwork and the different tools that are available? So I, I, was, I was asked this question before the session where someone said, like, what is the recommended approach for using groups? Should people be going to Outlook, Teams, uh, or which app does Microsoft recommend? Well, uh, at the end of the day, we realize that there are different ways people communicate depending on the project on which they're working. Uh, at the very bottom of this slide, and just a quick show of hands, how many people have seen this graphic before? Anyone? Okay. All right, so about, about half, half of the audience. All right, so, um, so just to briefly touch on it, at the bottom, we have email, right, which has been the traditional collaboration tool for the past couple of decades. You know, believe it or not, anytime you send an email, you're collaborating with someone. Uh, it's so easy to drop someone's email address on that two line, and you're instantly collaborating with somebody outside of your organization, right? So this is that initial ubiquitous tool. Uh, so on email, we uh, have enabled Office 365 groups, of course, uh, but then on the left side, you have these uh, scenarios where you're iterating more rapidly, you expect a quick response, um, perhaps you're not in that scenario where you're going to reply to email on an airplane or in a coffee shop, and uh, you have uh, perhaps live service incidents you're responding to. And that's where you, you want a, a, a more intimate um, form of communication, which is delivered by Microsoft Teams. Right? Microsoft Teams is built on Office 365 groups. So every time you create a Microsoft Teams team, you are creating an Office 365 group. Okay? On the right side of the visual, you have uh, what's called the outer loop. So at Microsoft, like I said, we have 100,000 people, and I don't keep track of everybody in every department. Uh, but when I need to reach out to somebody in the Xbox team to give them some feedback, uh, I can go to a Yammer group, and I can say, hey, who's the subject matter expert? And that's a great way to pull information and get a response. Uh, there was a customer I was talking to in the oil and gas industry uh, who had folks up at the corporate office, and they needed some quick information around some rigs that were in the field. And so they were able to reach out into the Yammer group, uh, quickly get in touch with people in, in Texas, and if they didn't have a Yammer group like that, they probably would have been chasing a string of emails over a couple days to find someone's manager before they finally got an answer. Uh, so, so Yammer is still a very valid scenario, and Yammer's done a lot of work to connect to Office 365 groups in, in the last couple of years. So uh, at the end of the day, it, probably the, the most important takeaway from this session is that Office 365 groups is a true membership service built on Azure Active Directory that powers all teamwork scenarios in Microsoft 365. Okay, so I'll just repeat that. Office 365 Groups is a membership service built on Azure Active Directory that powers all teamwork scenarios in Microsoft 365. Okay, uh, so I've highlighted the fact that when you create Teams and Planner and everything else, you create, you create a, a group under the covers. Uh, so this, um, this, this scenario is, um, uh, is extensible, uh, so the group's entities are exposed in Microsoft Graph and through PowerShell. Uh, so if there are scenarios that, um, that your business may need to adapt, you can actually take Microsoft Graph, extend that into things like Flow and other applications as well. So uh, what, have we, what have we done recently? I get the question a lot, uh, you know, how much are we investing in groups? What does the platform look like? Uh, this slide highlights some of the new innovations that we've delivered over the past year. 
Uh, and just to highlight a, a, a couple of these, um, you know, we really performed a lot of analysis on the engagement of groups, and uh, we found that groups are um, uh, very engaging when they when they are private. So we've made some changes to Outlook so that groups are created private by default now. Uh, you can still make them public across your org, uh, but we rolled out that change over the past year. Um, we at Microsoft Teams now supports dynamic membership rules, uh, which allows you to create a rule in Azure Active Directory that will automatically pull members into your Office 365 group. Um, Yammer has done a ton of work around the live event scenario so that you can actually um, initiate a live event and broadcast from within Yammer. And then we have integrations like Microsoft Stream and Microsoft Planner that have made a lot of great advancements in terms of tracking tasks assigned to group members, uh, creating videos that are shared to a group, and we're releasing new integrations like Microsoft Forms and Microsoft Project Roadmap as well. Previously, if you created a form, these were owned by an individual, right? And it was really tough to share the results across a team. Now you can actually have that form owned by an Office 365 group, which is pretty cool. All right, so let's take a, a look at a couple of these, these scenarios. Uh, so here, I'm going to start uh, in Yammer. Uh, like I said, there's a bunch of work Yammer's done over the past couple of years to integrate more deeply with, with groups. Uh, so down here on the right-hand side, uh, you'll see I have a link to SharePoint site, a OneNote, a planner, right? This all connected to my, to my group. Uh, one other thing they've done is that uh, previously, when you uploaded files into Yammer, they were stored in the Yammer service. Uh, so now what they're doing is actually leveraging the site connected to the group. Uh, so if I click in my status update here and pull in a, a file, so let's say I'm going to post this launch plan. And I say, here is the launch plan. Uh, what's going to happen is this file is going to be posted to my Yammer feed here. Uh, but then at the same time, it's being uploaded to the SharePoint site that's connected with this group. So when I drill in, I have an apps folder. And I can go into Yammer. And then right here, you can actually see that my document is uploaded right here into SharePoint. Uh, so previously, this was stored in the Yammer service, which was separate. Uh, but now it's in SharePoint, which means it's covered by all my compliance, my retention, and all my other policies, including things like Microsoft Search that I built on top of SharePoint. Um, so this is great, uh, because now all the documents that my users are, are frequently posting to Yammer are stored in SharePoint. Uh, so kind of staying with the, with the file scenario for just a minute, uh, of course, I can interact with my Office 365 groups here in, in Outlook. Uh, here I'm in a, a product launch event, and these are accessible on the left side of, of Outlook. Um, but here at the top, I have a link to files. Uh, so here in, in Outlook, what we've enabled is the ability uh, to not only see your conversations, but also see the files that are being used in SharePoint, as well as any files that are being emailed to the group. Uh, so this, this we announced a, a while ago. But what we've done recently is we completely reskin this experience by pulling in the shared uh, SharePoint files control. Uh, so you can see here, when I have uh, columns like name, modified, modified by, it's exactly what I'm seeing here in SharePoint. Uh, so that means anytime there's a new feature that's delivered in SharePoint, it's going to show up right here in my Outlook experience as well. Uh, so this has allowed us to deliver on probably the number one most requested feature uh, in the files experience, which was to create folders right here in Outlook. So here I could create a new folder. Let's just call this Ignite Amsterdam. Uh, and now this is going to be created in my SharePoint sites. I can drill in here. If I want, I can upload a file. Let's pick my uh, Word document again. And so just like that, I've uploaded a file right here into my group's experience in Outlook. I get the, the nice toast that, that SharePoint delivers. Um, and then you'll see I have all these great uh, previews of all my documents as well. So this is a really good example of driving coherence across a suite where your users don't have to learn a different experience in SharePoint and Outlook. What a round of applause for SharePoint, Yammer. This is really awesome. Love it. Because files are really key to, to collaborating in groups. All right, so let's go. Um, Back to my conversations view, we'll step back a little bit, right? So here you can see we've completely updated the user experience in Outlook. Uh, it has a, a much more fluid look and feel. Uh, and it's really allowed us to bring things like search front and center, 
right? So I can search for groups, I can search for, for users. Um, and so that's, that's great because we're able to iterate much more rapidly on the user experience. Uh, and we know when users come into the group's experience, um, they're really interested in the services connected to the group and the, and the members that are part of the group, which is why we've updated the group card. Uh, and you'll see this same group card flow throughout SharePoint and some of the other apps as well. Uh, you've got links to all the related services, the members. I can quickly copy the email address if I want to email the group. And then coming down uh, here, I can even see a quick peek into some of the emails that have been sent. Uh, now, we know based on our analytics that one of the most frequent actions in the card is to drill in and, and look at those members, which is why we created a second level of the group card. Uh, so here, when I go into, into this level, I'll see the user's job title, their role. I can change that. I can remove them from the group. Again, I have access to email and files, and I can even see that file that I uploaded just a, a couple seconds ago. Pretty cool. How do you like that? All right. Well, good. We're just uh, getting warmed up. Uh, so to take this another step further, we knew this was awesome, right? Um, but we really needed to provide more to the, the group owners, um, and which is why, for the first time ever this year, we announced the group's hub right here in Outlook. Uh, so previously, if I was an owner of a group, and let's say I had a group that had like three owners, right? And a group came up for expiry and we had to renew it. Um, I might not know if my colleague renewed that group or, or accepted the, the pending request because uh, we all got separate emails. Uh, so what we did was we created this view where I can come in here through the people tab in the Alec experience and now I can slice based on the groups I own or the groups of which I'm a member. Uh, up here at the top, I can filter on groups that are expiring. I can filter on groups that have pending requests. Uh, and when I look at, at these groups, I know exactly when they're going to expire, right? So I'm getting prompted, hey, this is going to expire in 21 days. Do you want to renew it? And I can do that if I want. And when I come down here um, to my uh, pending requests, I can actually expand this. And I can view all these pending requests to see all these users who are trying to, to join my group. Pretty cool? How do you like that? Come on, round of applause for the group side. OK. So this is great. I'm not going to re renew this group because we're going to go a little deeper into expiry in a minute. All right, so let's flip back to the, to the presentation here. All right, so ju just to recap what we saw. So we saw an updated um, experience in Yammer where files are stored directly in SharePoint, covered by all your compliance needs, right? We saw that updated files experience in Outlook, updated group cards, completely reskinned UI, and then we took a look at the new Groups Hub. All right, so that's just kind of a peek into some of the new functionality that, that we have enabled across the group's endpoints. Uh, so now let's talk about the, the management aspect, right? So how do I uh, enable self-service with, with governance? Well, it really comes down to a couple of options. We've seen two, two models. One, uh, you enable self-service for all users in your organization. This really uh, provides the widest amount of uh, flexibility to your users to select the apps that, that they would like to use, right? Uh, you can, of course, do that with um, governance controls like naming policy and, uh, and expiry. Um, but this really uh, allows them to, to make the choice of how they want to want to collaborate. Um, the second option here is to enable it for a limited subset of users. Uh, so very frequently I get the question, well, Mike, can you limit who can create groups? Can you scope that down? Uh, and yes, you can. You can create a security group that specifies exactly who can create groups. Uh, you just pass that ID in through a, a PowerShell commandlet, and then only those users can create Office 365 groups. Uh, this is useful in organizations that want to run a, a pilot uh, before they extend it to the broader parts of their organization. Um, I worked with a, um, uh, a large airplane manufacturer who had a very strict process around who can create groups. Um, so they would actually implement a workflow where they'd get a request to create that group. They would triage it, make sure that they didn't already have one that met those needs, and then they would, they would create it. So they scoped that down to, to a limited set of users. Uh, this is fine, but then the general guidance is then to think about how you're going to extend that to the other, to the other users. Because uh, very frequently, if you don't, um, and they have too many hurdles to overcome, they might just go pull out their phone, find the next collaboration app of choice, and then, and then they're off to the races. Uh, so you really want to prevent that scenario of, of shadow IT if it starts creeping up to be a, a threat in your, your organization. Uh, so as far as managing governance, there's, there's a stack of features available. I mean, each one of these could probably be their own session. Uh, so I, I have links here. Uh, this deck will be published afterwards uh, that go really deep into how to uh, specify that security group, 
We've rolled out the ability to uh, delete a group, uh, maintain it for a period of time, and allow you to restore it if your users did that accidentally. Um, so that was a huge enhancement that we shipped about a year ago. Um, but today, there's three primary governance features we'll, we'll focus on. Um, and that's the naming policy, expiry, and, and reporting features. Uh, so na naming policy is, uh, was, a, was a really huge feature request. Uh, this just hit general availability about two weeks ago. Uh, so it was in preview at, at Last Ignite. Um, and uh, the, the, the core scenario here is that a lot of users want to apply a particular prefix or a suffix to all of their group names. Uh, I was meeting with um, a sports media company two weeks ago, and they said their users were trying to play what we call the, the white pages effect. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's where <clears throat> you, you put the letter A in front of your group name, and then the next person puts AA, and then AAA, <laughs> and they start laddering up in, in the global address list. Um, and so they wanted to, to prevent that, right? So they wanted all their groups to be, to be grouped together. Uh, so we showed them that, yeah, you can use naming policy to apply a text um, prefix, uh, but it's actually even more powerful. You can um, specify an attribute, like a department name, to, to pull in. Uh, and so I'll, I'll show how that works today. The second thing you can do is specify a list of blocked words. Uh, so there is a, a scenario in the, in the education industry where uh, a student was creating a group using the teacher's name. <laughs> and then trying to intercept emails right, that, uh, that were potentially sent to that group because it kind of looked like the teacher. Uh, so here you could you know, prevent somebody from creating a group called Satya Nadella at, at Microsoft uh, or any other you know, profane words that, that you would like to choose. Um, the, the guidance here is to use short prefix, uh, short suffix. They do become part of the group name, uh, so they will show up. And you can use those dynamic attributes if, if you like. Uh, the second feature here is uh, group expiry. Uh, so very frequently we get the question, well, I, I've unleashed teams, it's awesome, people are creating all these teams, or creating plans, uh, but now all of a sudden I have you know, thousands of groups, what, what do I do? Uh, well, we, we delivered the expiry feature uh, because if some of these groups are becoming stale or they were created for test purposes, people are playing around with it, uh, you, you don't want your admins to have to go through the overhead of always scrolling through these in the address list or in Azure Active Directory. Uh, so you can create an expiry policy to automatically expire groups in six months, 12 months, even 31 days. Um, this would require the group owners uh, to renew that group and uh, they will get a series of notifications, right? So they'll be notified 31 days before, 15 days before, one day before, and then the group is, is deleted. Um, this, is, uh, this is great uh, because then you, you really get rid of a lot of those, um, those groups are, that are no longer being, being used. So I'll, I'll show you how that, that can be configured today. Uh, and then the last part of that is uh, if you have groups that are ownerless, you can set up a, an email address where notifications can be dropped in case the owner has left the, the company or, or something like that. Uh, so the third aspect here is, is group reporting. Uh, so we, we've done a lot of work uh, in the Microsoft 365 Admin Center and across Azure Active Directory to make sure you can extract the data that, that you need. Um, a lot of those reports now uh, can be pivoted on Office 365 groups. So when you're looking at site usage, mail usage, things like that, you can filter on sites and mailboxes that are connected to, to groups. Um, so it's, it's super powerful. And uh, a lot of these actions, like inviting members and, and modifying ownership, are uh, written to the audit logs. Uh, so you can go grab your favorite log parser and pull those out and, and process them. Um, great. So, uh, so there's been a few more innovations over the past year on the group's administration experience. Um, we had a lot of users who uh, wanted to take a SharePoint site they already created with content and use it as a starting point for an Office 365 group. So rather than start with a brand new empty site when they present that group, they had a lot of content they had curated. Uh, so SharePoint has done a ton of work uh, to let people take that site and then create a group from it. Um, so that's, that's huge uh, if you're interested in that, in that scenario. Um, we do now support the ability to edit the email address associated with the group, include things like dot in the name, which, which weren't there before. Uh, like I said, naming policy is now generally available, uh, so people are free to use that in a production environment. Uh, and then we've also got uh, huge features like multi-geo support, which rolled out over the past year. So if your organization is global and you have users that are based in Europe or the US, the group will be uh, provisioned wherever their user is, is homed. Uh, so there's a lot of work that went into that, that scenario. 
Great. Uh, okay, so now let's take a look at some of the, the group expiry and the uh, naming policy scenarios. Um, so like I said earlier, um, Office 365 Groups is built on Azure Active Directory, right? So uh, there are some settings that can be configured right here in AED. Uh, and so when I come into AED, I just navigate to portal.azure.com, and I click Azure Active Directory and Groups, and there's a tab here called Expiration. Uh, so here's where I can turn on Group Expiry. Uh, you'll see here, out of the box, we provide the ability to expire these after 180 days or 365. Uh, and I have this set to 31 right now. Uh, and like I said, uh, you can specify an email where uh, messages will be delivered for any groups that don't have owners. Uh, one best practice we've seen is that a lot of customers will create another Office 365 group that includes all of their admins. And then they'll actually just put that email address here as the, as the catch-all. Um, so this is a pretty good way to make sure that, that you have some redundancy in place. Uh, from a product team perspective, we're, we're looking at ways to improve that ownerless group scenario even more in the future. Uh, and later I'll talk a little bit about some of the tips and tricks uh, where you can run some daily reports to actually scan for that. Uh, so here I've, I have an option. I can enable expiry for all groups in my org or just selected groups. Uh, so here I have selected, and it's uh, pretty easy to add a new uh, group. So here I can just search for my uh, marketing group. I can pull that in, uh, I can put that in my list. And so now I've got uh, four groups on which I'm applying expiration settings, right? So now when, when these groups expire, my, my owners will, will get an email. Uh, so let's take a look at what that, what that email looks like. Uh, so here I'm in Outlook Desktop and um, I've actually received an email that says, my Mark 8 project team is set to expire April 11th. Um, in this email, uh, we're showing how many members are in this group. So my owner has an idea, you know, have people abandoned this group? Are they still in this group? Is it still being used? Um, and then I have links down here to the activity uh, for this group. So if I want to double check, have there been recent conversations or any chats and teams, I, I can do that. Uh, I can renew this group right here from this mail. Um, the next generation of, of this experience will actually be an actionable uh, card. So when you hit renew, it will update dynamically in this email, and it'll update in each of the emails my owners have received. Uh, so just kind of giving you some insight into, into where this is going. Uh, so as a, as a user, uh, you know, one, one scenario that we got a lot of feedback on was that if the group isn't being used in mail very frequently, some users might miss those notifications, right? Uh, so, so here's an example of how, how Microsoft Teams has actually um, uh, gone out and read that expiry object. And uh, so they're actually uh, recognizing the fact that the group associated with this team is going to expire, and they're pulling a notification right into Teams. Uh, so here you have an exclamation point. It's notifying the user, hey, this is going to, this is going to expire. You should go renew it. Um, so Teams has done this. We're working with other apps uh, like Yammer as well. It's another good example where there might be a lot of activity in, in Yammer. Uh, but this really tries to help notify the users in whichever endpoint they're using that the group is going to be renewed. So what do you think about expiry so far? Does that solve some of the needs? Huh? Yeah? OK. Let's see a round of applause if it works or not. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Good. Making sure people are still awake. All right. So that's, the first, uh, so that's the first set of demos on governance. Now let's take a look at naming policy. All right? Uh, here, uh, yeah, like I just showed, AED is great for configuring a lot of these, uh, these settings. Um, but of course, there's a lot of things that you can do in, in PowerShell as well. Um, so here, uh, you, know, feel, you, know, you can um, you know, take note of some of this, but like I said, these examples um, are going to be posted, so you can just kind of sit back and, and, and enjoy it for right now. Uh, here, I, I'm connecting to the Azure Active Directory um, uh, PowerShell modules, right? Um, so let's log in here. Okay, um, and what I've done in this script is I've outlined uh, the, the various settings that can be configured. Since we're built on AED, we're creating uh, Azure Active Directory setting objects here. Okay, and on that object, I can then start setting various policies. Um, so here is my naming policy. Um, so earlier I mentioned I can apply uh, just a uh, plain text string if I want. Here I actually included um, a department parameter right here. Uh, so I'm saying whenever my users create a group, go pull their department from Azure Active Directory and make it a, a prefix, okay? My uh, blocked words list is right here. 
Uh, this might be the only session at your conference where you see profanity on screen, <laughs> but it's a valid example. Um, you can use whatever language you like. Um, and when I scroll down, here I have a usage guidelines uh, URL. So in my group creation experiences, uh, this URL will show up. So when my users have questions or if we want to create an internal page that explains how to use groups, uh, I can point my users to, to that page. Uh, that's a, a very good best practice. Uh, and then I've configured a few things around classification. Uh, we won't go too deep into that today, but I, I can require that each of my groups have a classification. So my group owners indicate if it's highly classified, medium, or low. Uh, this is a great way to, to drive additional behaviors on that group. And we're actually integrating that more deeply across the um, uh, security and compliance center in, in Microsoft. Uh, so then the, the last thing I have here is uh, the ability I mentioned earlier, which is to say, hey, only people in this security group are allowed to create Office 365 groups. Um, so this is that, that feature we discussed around how to, how to lock down some of the, some of the scope. Uh, so if I just uh, pull these back from AD, uh, this is kind of what they, what they look like when they're loaded into, into my directory. Um, so now, uh, if I take a look at uh, my, my users here, um, again, I'm in AD, and this time, instead of looking at my groups, I'm going to go into my users. And we'll use Alex as an example. Um, so Alex has a department specified down here of uh, marketing, right? So he works in the marketing department. That's great. Um, so when, when Alex comes out and he tries to create a group in Yammer, um, I can say uh, Ignite Amsterdam, sure. Uh, here you can see we're automatically pulling in his department as a prefix. So that's, that's pretty cool. So that would be used. Uh, I'm using Yammer as an example to show you it's not just an, an Outlook feature, right? Yammer now acknowledges this. Um, Microsoft Teams also acknowledges this. Um, so when I click uh, Create Team, out here in Teams, let's refresh my, my Teams experience. And I'll click Build Team from Scratch, Private. Um, I can say Ignite Amsterdam Demo. Um, so you'll see here, Teams is using the exact same thing, right? So when I click Create, um, it's going to go provision my team, and that uh, department will be part of my uh, prefix. I'll hit Skip. Great. And so right now it's, it's part of the team. So it's actually retrieved from AD and included as part of the group name. How do you like that? <laughs> awesome. Great. Uh, let's jump back into the deck for a minute here. OK. All right. So um, we looked at some of the you know, high-level groups enhancements across the UI. We looked at how to apply expiration policies, how to apply naming policies, talked about some of the other controls. Um, so now let's talk about guests. Uh, you can invite people from outside your organization to collaborate in your Office 365 groups. It's built on the Azure B2B concepts. Uh, and, and we've intentionally made it very easy for group members to in, invite these guests. Right? Um, you can invite basically you know, any of the hundreds of millions of email addresses on this planet. Um, they get added as an actual user in Azure Active Directory. Uh, so what happens is they get inserted. Uh, you have audit logs around who invited them. And then once they become a guest in a group, they'll start receiving emails in their personal inbox, whether it's Gmail, Yahoo, or even in another Office 365 tenant. Um, so they can start replying to that group and collaborating. And the second thing they'll get access to are the files inside that group. Uh, so using Azure B2B, they'll have access to SharePoint, where they can download files, view files, and co-author with, with everyone else. Um, so there's, there's a few. Um, uh, points of guidance that we put together around guests because I think you know there's always some um, questions around, oh, OK, how should I go about this? And it kind of raises some, some eyebrows. Um, there are some, some controls that we've put into the platform uh, that can help scope who you can invite. Uh, the first thing that you could do is um, specify a list of allowed domains or blocked domains. 
Okay, so if uh, Contoso says, hey, we don't want anybody collaborating with anybody from Fabricam, those guys are our, our enemy, our competitor, you can block Fabricam.com. All right, otherwise, if you only want to support them collaborating with a couple of key partners, you could put those, those in as well. Um, so that's, that's the first aspect. Um, the second is there is a guest inviter role in Azure Active Directory. Uh, so if you only want certain users to be able to invite guests, you could assign them that role. All right. By default, anyone can invite guests, but if you want to scope it down, you can just assign that guest inviter role to, to a select few, few people. Uh, the, the third thing, uh, and we'll take a look at this today, uh, is that there's a new process we shipped called guest access reviews. Um, when, you, when you invite a guest, the, the next question we got from customers was, well, uh, how can I periodically ensure that I still want to give access? to all these people, and, and how can I flush them out, and you know, are they just going to be a guest forever? Uh, and no, they don't have to be. We created this process called guest access review, where you would set up a, a cycle, and every six months, the guest owners, or the group owners, uh, could be required to reattest that those guests should be members. Uh, you could set that up uh, monthly, you know, two months, three months, however often you like. Uh, so when, when you look at these, at these three, um, uh, at these three capabilities, as you go from, from left to right here, it really extends the reach in terms of, uh, of who can invite guests um, and how they can collaborate in your organization. Um, of course, if you scope down those user permissions to only a few individuals, then, then you'll have the smallest amount of people actually in, inviting guests. Um, as you enable certain domains, but then give the access to everyone in the org, then you've kind of opened it up a little bit more, more freely. Um, and, then, and then the third aspect, of course, as well, if you are you know, opening up for everyone and enabling all domains, but then only enabling it for maybe uh, a few select groups, um, then you've really extended even, even more reach because uh, it gets the guest uh, invitation process into, into more people's hands. Um, so that uh, the guest access review scenario I was talking about is, is interesting uh, because you you can really um, uh, define the reviews to occur on your terms. Uh, you can um, you can really put the power in the hands of the group owner, and uh, rather than only having to make them uh, confirm guests should be a member, you can also make them confirm all members should be members. Um, this is interesting because. Um, uh, you might have like a leadership team group where maybe every six months uh, you want to ensure that everybody in there is correct because there's a lot of NDA information being to, um, uh, discussed. Uh, so you can do that with, with access reviews. When a user is um, not renewed or denied, then they're immediately blocked from, from sign-in uh, to the service. Great, so let's, let's take a look and, and see what this, what this looks like. Um, so the first thing I'll do is show uh, how easy it is to, to invite a guest. Uh, so here I have my group, my Mark 8 project group I'm using in, in Outlook. And when I click the, the Members tab on the right, I can click Add Members. And here, um, it's as easy as typing in someone's email address. So here I'll, I'm going to use a Gmail address. Uh, just to give you an example, it could be any domain from, from any service. Uh, so here, the first thing we're doing is notifying people that um, you're adding a guest to this group. And we're saying they'll have limited access to, to group resources. So um, that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and, and add this, this Gmail user. And now um, I'll click Close. And so when I um, scroll down, um, so now you'll see this user um, has been added as a guest. Right, so they're they're a brand new member inside this group. Um, I have a policy where guests can't be owners. Right, um, that's how we, we handle it at Microsoft as well. Uh, we want full time employees to be the owners and be responsible for for our groups. Um, and then the other thing that we're doing here is up at the top. Uh, we're actually now saying this is a public group with guests. Uh, so when users come into this experience, they'll automatically be notified that hey, there are there are guests that are part of this uh, part of this group. When I, uh, when I look at my, my global uh, address list here in Azure Active Directory, uh, again, this is my, my list of all my, my users inside my entire tenant. Um, if I search for that, that user, uh, you'll see they're listed just as you know, any other user in my, in my org. Uh, so when I scroll down, they, they have an object ID. They're noted as, as being a guest. I see their, their email address. Um, I have uh, audit information around who, who invited them. And if I need to, I can actually pivot and see uh, which groups they belong to. Right now, it's just one. Um, but this would be my, my full list of groups to which this, this guest belongs. Um, so this, this person is in the Office 365 group. 
they're in Azure Active Directory. Uh, and then we can, we can kind of take a look at what their, um, what their experience looks like being, being invited to this group. Uh, so here, I'm logged in as the, the same user here in Gmail, right? Mike McLean01. Um, and this is the, the email that I've received and in inviting me to this group. Uh, so the email is telling me that I can start a conversation with this group. Uh, and we actually have a link right here. Um, so I can immediately click this. It's giving me some insight into who are the members of this group to which I was invited. Uh, and then the second thing is it, it has a link to the files, right? So here it's telling me uh, I can actually access the SharePoint files and start collaborating with the, the files in, in this group. Uh, so this is great. And I received this just in my, in my personal inbox and I can start, start collaborating. Uh, so so that's, that's the process on how to invite um, a guest and kind of what that looks like from, from the guest end user perspective. Uh, now, to take it a step further, uh, we'll talk about that, that access review cycle, right? So I mentioned that uh, after a certain period of time, I want to validate all my users should still be guests. Uh, so here in Azure Active Directory, on the same page where we had the expiration settings, I have a new link called access reviews, right? So here's where I can create a new access review, and we'll call this um, Amsterdam Access Review Demo. Uh, and right now, I'm going to say, go ahead and start this today, and we'll make this monthly. Um, so here, I've got a review I'm going to create that's monthly. We'll just end this. Um, well, normally, I'd, I'd push that out a little bit. Uh, and then down here, uh, these are the options I mentioned earlier, where I could say, do I want to validate guest users only or all members of the group? Uh, so this is, this is pretty powerful. Um, and then uh, let's just apply this to the marketing group for right now. Uh, so I'll pull this in, hit select, and great. Uh, so it's fine. It's telling me that we already have another access review, which is okay. Um, so I'll hit start. Uh, so now you'll see this, this access review is being created. It's giving me some notifications up here. Uh, it was added successfully. I can click here to, to kick it off. Um, so let's refresh this page and double check the status. OK, great. Uh, so it looks like it's, it's initializing. Uh, and then what will happen is uh, when it's done initializing, it will actually kick out an email to those group owners, like I, like I mentioned. Uh, so here in, in Outlook, I'm just going to show this in Outlook Desktop. Um, you'll see down here, I have an example where my group owner received an email that said, hey, uh, you need to go complete this, this access review. So it's telling me time has come. Uh, we need to validate that all these users should still have access to our, to our Office 365 group. Uh, I think, let's see. It looks like I already got the email for the one we just created. So why don't we take a look at this and see if this one works. Um, so I'm going to click Start Review. And uh, what this will do is it'll bring me back out here to my uh, Azure Active Directory access review uh, management page. Um, and so here, it's told me, uh, yeah, I'm in the middle of my Amsterdam access review. And there's one user uh, who's a guest user outside of our org that I need to reattest, right? Uh, now, what's interesting is the access review process is actually um, uh, providing some recommendations. <laughs> so uh, thanks, uh, AED is telling me, um, Tony actually hasn't signed in for the last 30 days. Uh, so it's hinting, maybe he doesn't really need to be a part of this group, right? Um, but I know Tony. Tony's a, a pretty good guy. Uh, so I'm going to select him. And now let's go ahead and, and complete the review. So I'm going to say approved, because I know Tony was on vacation. Um, so we'll say Tony is approved. Um, get back from vacation. And so now I'll hit save. And uh, so now what it's going to do is it'll update uh, Tony's status, and then it's going to validate, yes, Tony's OK. He can continue being part of this group. Uh, there's information that's logged that says it was approved. It was approved on March 21st, 2019. So we have the time. And then the user who did the approvals is written to the auto log. So how do you like that? Pretty cool flow. <laughs> OK, awesome. So we try to make sure the demos build a little bit <laughs> throughout the session. All right. 
Okay, so, so we just took a look at um, the guest process, right? How to invite someone, what does that look like, and how do you create an, an access review? Um, so now let's briefly touch on some best practices for implementing groups at, at scale. Uh, so we talked about the enterprise controls, right, around life cycle, handling pr uh, proliferation. Um, usage guidelines I pointed out earlier is a really useful feature. When you have a large organization and you need to put some structure around how groups are used, you can document that internally, point people to, to that link. Um, we are doing more work to extend classification into um, the, the security and compliance centers, like I mentioned. Uh, so in the future, when you have a central place where labels are defined, um, you can actually require those to be set on groups, and then they'll drive various be behaviors. Um, one, uh, one example would be if you want to make sure that all um, highly confidential groups cannot have guests, uh, well, you'll be able to, to configure that, right? Uh, there's ways you can do that today uh, using things like PowerShell uh, and Microsoft Graph, uh, and I'll show you a couple of those examples here. Um, I mentioned earlier the, the ownerless group scenario. So when you have a large company where uh, people are coming in and out, changing departments, maybe even leaving the, the organization, um, you might want to identify which of those groups are ownerless. Um, this is an example of, of how PowerShell can be used to, to um, process the, the group owner list and then identify those groups that, that don't have owners. Uh, in a minute, I'll show um, a nice report <clears throat> that's available um, uh, via GitHub. It's open source that actually takes us a step further, so you're not just looking at, at PowerShell and, and some data. Uh, the second scenario here is if you have classification required, you can come through and audit which groups don't have classifications assigned. Uh, so you might have some groups that were created through Microsoft Graph API, behind, you know, through some apps, or maybe you change the labels in your organization uh, in, in some interesting way. Uh, and so this is an example of how to, to audit those groups, identify the list that, that don't have classification assigned, just to kind of give you, give you an idea. Um, the third example here is around um, auditing groups that have conflicting properties. So for example, if you have a public group in your organization and then uh, all of a sudden, uh, or, or you have a private group and all of a sudden there's external guests and, and you don't want to support that, um, you could identify those groups um, and then flag them and send mails to your, to your admins. Um, so uh, you know, I, do get, uh, I do get the question pretty frequently, uh, well, um, how, how can we integrate the, the group creation process into other apps like, like Microsoft Flow? Um, and uh, so when, when you're, um, well, let me come back to my tab here in, in SharePoint. Uh, so, so when you have a large organization like, like I've just described, um, yes, you can create groups from Outlook or you can create groups from, from Yammer or, or Teams. Um, but often there's a need to, to funnel that group creation process, maybe through a, a single entry point. Um, when you create a group in Outlook today, yes, you can enable it for Teams later, uh, but there are a lot of customers who want to um, uh, complete that all-in-one action, right, where you create that group and it's automatically enabled for Outlook and Teams uh, together. Uh, and you might even want to require some additional information from the user around, like, why do they want this group or what's it going to be used for uh, to perhaps push it through, like, a, a triage process, right? Uh, so since, since groups are exposed in Microsoft Graph and through PowerShell, you can actually write additional code that extracts that information uh, and then build experiences uh, through things like SharePoint or using Microsoft Flow for, for workflow. Uh, so, so what we have here now is a demo where we, we actually created a, a group uh, request and creation experience uh, using a SharePoint list. Um, and then it's going to kick off a flow for approval and then come back and, and provision the group. Uh, so here, uh, it, again, like I said, this code is available through GitHub. I already tweeted out the, the link earlier today. Um, but I'm just going to walk through this to kind of give you a, an example. Uh, so here I'll say, uh, this is a group for, for Mike. Uh, I'll say Mike group six. Um, one of the policies I might want to put in place with my org is that groups are, are private by default. Um, so I could set that in an experience like this, or I could uh, require a certain classification be set you know, on, on all groups. Uh, we have some customers that want all their groups to default high, some want them all to default low, uh, some are somewhere in between. So by building an experience like this, you have a little more flexibility in terms of what, what can be set. Uh, another um, another great um, uh, feature here is that you could say, hey, 
uh, specify an alternate owner or specify the uh, manager if it's somebody else from, from what's in the, in the directory. Um, this is good because then you have uh, a two owner policy that you can implement where you always have some, some re redundancy. Uh, so now I'll click yes, I want to create a team automatically as part of this group and I'm going to, to save this, this entry. Um, so now uh, I'm going to select this item and I'll click, um, let's see here. Request manager approval for a selected item. Uh, so now I'm going to send this off uh, to my manager. And here I'm going to add some notes that says, um, please approve my group. OK, and I'll click Run Flow. Um, so what's happening now is a, a flow is being kicked off, right? So it, it's going to pick up the. Uh, it's going to pick up the fact that I requested a new Office 365 group, uh, and we'll take a look at uh, kind of what this what this flow looks like. So here uh, I'm in the Flow Manager, and uh, when I scroll down, you'll see there was a new item that was entered in SharePoint and Get Item Request. So now we've we've started the the approval process. Uh, so when I flip over to um, Adele, who's the manager, you'll see Adele um, has gotten a request to approve this group, right? So Adele will come through and say, um, yes, this is approved, and she'll go ahead and, and submit this. Um, so this will go through. This is another example of these, of these actionable cards, right? So she's approved this. Uh, and now when I, when I come back and refresh my flow, I'll take a look and, and see where the, the status is. OK, great. So it's running. I'll give this a sec. And so what the, what the flow will do is um, once it's done, it'll actually publish back the status to my SharePoint task list here. Um, so now I see, OK, great, my, my request was uh, approved. And it looks like the flow ran su successfully. My, uh, my user has been informed that, it, that it's done. Um, so let's take a look and see if this has provisioned the, the group yet. Sometimes these uh, take a little while. So when I flip back to Outlook, like I said, the, the groups are in the, the left-hand side here. And I'll click More, and here it is. Great. Uh, so here is my new group. You'll see my, my naming policy, uh, which is to include GRP, has been uh, applied since I've defined that in Azure Active Directory. Uh, and so now I have my brand new Office 365 group with the name that I provided. Um, and I can start uh, adding users. You'll see, see here at the top, it's um, highly confidential, which is what was selected in, in my flow. Um, so if I come over here to Teams, the last thing I'll do is take a look at my group in Microsoft Teams. And there it is. Great. OK, so here, uh, if I zoom in, you'll see, um, actually, I'll just pop back out. Um, you'll see here, my group was created based on my request from SharePoint, right? It was approved by my manager, uh, who has a final uh, approval process. Uh, my group is in Outlook. And since I said, hey, I also want to use this in Teams for some internal chat, we've automatically enabled this in Microsoft Teams. So pretty cool? All right. So there's, so there's a lot of moving parts there. Like I said, the, the code for this um, is actually open source from one of our MVPs at work. Um, that's the name of their, their company. Um, so that's linked, that's linked here in the, in the presentation today. Uh, so the, the last thing I'll show um, is that, uh, yes, it, there's a lot of great reporting that we've built into the Microsoft 365 Admin Center um, and places like that. Um, but you, you can also extract the data around groups, and you can build a lot of your own visuals, right? So here's an example of, of an awesome groups dashboard. Again, this is also part of the governance toolkit that's, that's open source, um, where uh, we've actually built a page into SharePoint where you can see your total count of groups across your org, uh, total count of owners, how many people are owners, uh, how many people are just members, and how many guests have been invited inside my, my organization. Uh, over here, if I wanted to, I could actually drill in and, and say, oh, wow, I have um, this many groups that don't have owners. Well, you know, which, which groups are these? Um, so this is like fully interactive, so I can click it. I can look at which groups have you know, high numbers of members or high numbers of guests. Um, and you can see this just kind of filters all the results as I, as I click through. So I have you know, a couple of, couple of really, really big groups here with like 24 members. 
members, which is awesome. Uh, and then it looks like I've got you know a couple of groups here you know that that have one guest. Um, one of those is the group that that we just looked at earlier. Um, so this is this is a really great example of a of a report that you could build if you want to slice and dice based on uh, you know groups that have particular numbers of owners, classifications, or visibility across your service. How do you like that? <laughs> awesome. All right. OK, so uh, I did include a screenshot of that report because everyone likes to take a look at those visuals. Um, all right, so we, we walked through some really cool uh, flow demos there where we provision groups um, using Microsoft Graph. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about Microsoft IT, and then we'll close with our, with our roadmap. Um, so I get the question all the time, well, how does Microsoft manage groups? Um, that's why we put together this slide. Uh, so yes, we have enabled self-service across our, our company. Um, it's tied to dynamic membership rules, so only full time employees can create groups. Um, that way, if we have a vendor who's working with a group, um, they, they can become a member no problem whatsoever. Uh, but we definitely want employees to be responsible for the content that's in, in those groups. Um, we have implemented uh, naming policy to prevent block words. Uh, we're not using prefix suffix, um, but we do have a set of words that, that can't be used. And we have implemented expiry lifecycle. Uh, so our group owners must renew groups every 180 days. Um, so we've, we're going through the same processes that, that we're recommending to our, to our customers. Um, we do have... Um, we do have custom jobs that have been written that scan over these groups. So if a group is created, uh, let's say, highly confidential, and then it's showing up as a public group where everybody has access, um, we'll actually flag that group, notify the owner, and, and change that. Uh, same thing with things like, like guest access. So we've put in uh, a, lot of that, um, a lot of that workflow that I described earlier. Um, those classifications are set in Azure Active Directory right now. Uh, but of course, we're looking at moving to, to deeper labels in the in the future um, so uh, let's see uh, what is our so what does our roadmap look like um, so yes we we communicated uh, you know an initial version of our uh, roadmap at ignite in September um, and we've been able to make some great progress on, on some of these items uh, when you look at scenarios like group expiry lifecycle, um, it's great you have to you know, renew these groups, but if a group is actively being used, do you really want to bug group owners <laughs> every six months to renew those groups? Maybe not, right? Uh, so we're actually looking at um, building intelligence uh, around the activity that's happening. So if there are, are current conversations feeding in around that group or files being modified, those groups can be renewed automatically. Uh, that's one key enhancement we're working on with Expiry. The second is extending those in-app notifications. Uh, we showed Teams earlier, how Teams shows you uh, when the team is going to expire. And so we're pulling that into more experiences like the Groups Hub and Yammer and some of the other endpoints. Uh, we have new roles that we're looking at building. Um, so if you have an organization where, let's say, an admin needs to manage uh, membership across a set of groups or renew the lifecycle for groups, um, you might not want to force them to be a member of all those groups. Uh, so right now, we're building a new group admin role where you can assign a user to be an administrator of groups um, without making them a global admin and giving them, you know, access to everything in the, in the tenant. Um, the, uh, the next thing we're looking at is um, uh, how our customers can leverage membership of groups uh, to drive membership in other groups. Uh, this is particularly key if you have, um, let's say, a set of engineers uh, and, and you're going to provide access to like a source control repository um, and then you're going to add them to a feature crew and another group uh, to send you know, email status. You don't want to have to add the same 10 people like every time. Uh, so we're doing a lot of uh, deep work with the Azure Active Directory team to understand how you can take an existing group and use that to drive membership in another group. Um, so that, that's a really big area we're, we're looking at. Um, I mentioned um, integrating deeper with the labels in the Security Compliance Center. Um, you're going to see new enhancements roll out in that group card around how to search for members. Uh, today it's a flat list, but as you have larger groups, um, it's, it's not feasible to scroll through that, that whole list, right? You want to be able to search quickly and, and type in a group member's name. Uh, you'll see new enhancements rolling out around how group calendar invites can be managed. Uh, today, when you come into that group calendar and you schedule an event, well, everybody in that group gets 
invited. <laughs> and it can be kind of annoying if there's 100 people there. Uh, so the scenario we're trying to support is that you can put a, a meeting on that group calendar and just invite select people. Um, that way, if, if a group owner leaves or the ownership transitions, uh, someone new can come in and still manage that invite. Uh, but you don't actually have to have all 100 people on, on every single meeting. Uh, there's a bunch of enhancements to admin centers that are being um, rolled out uh, across Microsoft 365, and you'll see new enhancements around Outlook Desktop in terms of how you can drag and drop messages in, into groups uh, because we're continuing to invest in the group's experience in, in Outlook Desktop. All right, so I know we covered a lot today. I hope it was worth your time. Just to recap, <laughs> uh, we covered you know, highlights of uh, new groups features we shipped across the, the app endpoints, right? Um, we talked about self-service governance, expiry, naming policy, uh, how to collaborate outside your org. And then we talked about uh, some of these best practices for managing groups at scale. Um, I would say next steps, um, definitely go back and, and think about the type of plan you want to put in place for enabling groups and how, how you could make self-service work. Um, uh, check out our fast track resources. Um, please submit your session evaluations. Uh, we take your feedback uh, to heart, and we've even modified our presentations as we've gone through the, the tour this year, uh, which is why you saw a lot of new stuff uh, here in Amsterdam. Uh, and I've got um, a lot of key links, including the link to GitHub repositories and um, and Microsoft Tech Community here as well. Um, and I've got uh, last thing I'll mention is. Um, uh, Today's my, my 14 year anniversary at Microsoft, actually. <laughs> so I've got uh, like 14 of these really cool Microsoft stylus pens uh, with, a, with a touch endpoint. So if you have a question, um, you can find me here. I'll also be at um, the Ask the Experts booth uh, probably for the rest of the day. So we can chat some more about groups if, if you're around. Thanks a lot. <laughs>